All right, they should be recording. All right, so the screen should have gone to um, my iPad. Emma, can you see that? Yep, I can see it. Perfect. First one was asking about, what was it? Let me take a look. Question. So this should be, yeah, this is quiz three. So we're starting off from quiz three. So for question number three, what mass of glucose must be dissolved in 325 grams of water to raise the boiling point to the solution of 102.5 degrees Celsius? So it tells us that the solvent is water and we know that the boiling point is 100. It tells us and it's common knowledge, right? So if our new solutions boiling point is 102.5, we can take 102.5 minus 100 and our delta T for boiling point is 2.5. And we know from our equation that delta T equals I times M times K. And it gives us the K value right here. So our K value is 0 0.512 times M. And our I value, our event Hoff factor of our solute is just one because it's a non-electrolyzer, there's only one. So, and remember, if it's a pure sol solvent and there's no solute, the Van Hoff is just zero. And that's why the delta T is zero because <laughs> nothing is changing for a pure solvent. 2.5. So if we were to divide by one and divide by 0 0.512, divide that over here. And I actually don't have the calculations written down. So I think, unfortunately, you're gonna have to watch me plug this in. Okay, 2.5 divided by 0 0.512. Our molality B. Yeah, 4.88. And for molality is 4.88. We know that that is moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. And it tells us right here on top of that. All right, so we have 325 grams of solvent. So that's 0 0.325. Right, so 4.88 equals moles over 0 0.325. We just multiply 0 0.325 over and our moles is equal to 1.59. And remember, if that's if 1.59 moles of solute causes this delta T, right? And we're looking at what mass of glucose, well, we have the molar mass we have moles and we're looking for mass, which is grams. So that's just a really easy conversion. Let's change it to red so we know what we're doing. So we have 1.59 moles. We have 180.2 grams per mole. And our grams will turn out to be 285 grams. I'll just say 286. And whenever we, I grade your test, or your quizzes, there is a range. So don't worry if it's not exact. And the ranges are pretty generous, so don't worry. All right, let's move on to number four. So the vapor pressure of a solution containing sugar um, has a molar, yeah, it's a disaccharide, molar mass 342 grams, you have 750 grams of water at 27.84 torr. What is the mass of the sugar of the solution? In the solution, the vapor pressure of water added with the solution is 28.35. So we know our equation, all right, so the pressure of a solution, oh, hold on. Trying to see if anyone's in the um the waiting room real quick. Hold on, Emma. Uh, all right, I don't think so. Thought I saw a notification. Okay. So our pressure of our solvent is equal to our. Oh, my bad. I was writing solution. Our solution equals our mole fraction of our sol solute, I believe. You can double check that for me. You guys will have the um, equation sheet, but is that the x of the solute? I'm pretty sure it is. It says p solution equals x solvent times p of the pure solvent. That's right. 
right? The more solvent there is, the greater the mole fraction and the more the mole fraction, the closer it is to the P of the solvent. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And remember the pressure of the, um, the pressure units used, it doesn't matter because if you have tor over here, you have tor over here, they can't, they'll cancel out. So the pressure doesn't matter as long as, as they're the same on both sides. So the solution is 28.35 tor. This is 27.84 tor. X solvent. Oops. Just divide 27.84 on both sides. Oh, wait, I had these backwards. My bad. <laughs> it's supposed to be 27.84. Oh, my gosh. 27.84, 28.35, there we go. There we go, okay. Because remember, the fraction in that um, equation should always be a fraction, it should never be greater than one. So that's a big indicator of what should go on top. All right, our, our mole fraction of our solvent, 0.982. Right, so the moles of our solvent, those total moles. Right, now let's start working. So we have 700 and I'm gonna use blue for the side, 750 grams of water. Let's change that to um, moles. So if, if water is 18.01 grams per mole, Let's divide that over. 750 divided by 18.01. It's going to be 41.64 moles of water. Okay. So if our moles of solvent is now 41.64, our total moles is 41.64 plus, let's call it Y. Now, if that's the case, we only have one variable left, and that is Y. So if we were to, let's say, switch these up. So we would have, we would switch up like 40, we would have 41.64 divided by 0 0.982 equals, you know, let's just write it out. Let's not be stingy with space. 0.982 equals 41.64 plus Y. And then we subtract 41.64 from that quotient uh, let's do 41.64 divided by 0 0.982. That's 42.41 minus 41.64. Our Y is now 0 0.767 moles. And that's the moles of our solute. Now, what is the mass of the sugar? Well, again, this is just the simple part. We, have, we know what our solute is. We're not solving for it. We're not solving for the molar mass. It gives us the molar mass. So we just convert that molar mass 300. Oh, my bad. Convert our solved, our solved moles. There we go. 0 0.767 to get the mass. So we have one mole. It's 342 grams. And comes out to be times 342. It's 262.3 grams. And again, um, on the test, you'll have something, you'll find an answer that's pretty close. So obviously you pick that one and then on your quizzes, there's always a range. Let's move on to number five. So number five, the reaction um, of mono or nitrogen mono, oh, it's not bad. I'm, this is 1035 stuff <laughs> plus O2 is nitrogen di dioxide. Um, second order in NO, so we have NO, my bad, two. First order in O2, so all of our reactions are accounted for and they have orders. At a particular temperature, the rate constant for this reaction is 7.1 times 10 to the ninth. What is the rate of the reaction when you're given these? So let's go ahead and write out our rate law. So from reading it, we know our rate law already. It's just K, which it is given. I'm just not going to write it out. N O to the second, O two to the one. And we plug in K, 
we plug in the NO they give us and we plug in the O2 they give us. It's just writing out the rail on, plugging it in. These questions are really nice and very generous. Don't overthink it. Make sure you're very slow with your um, calculations because you don't want to mess stuff up, especially with these scientific notation questions. So I'm doing 3.4 times 10 to the negative 2. Let me square that. All right, so that's 0 0.00156. And O2 is just 2.6 times 10 to the negative 4. Then our K is just 7.1 times 10 to the 9th. Let's multiply all that together. All right, times 2.6 to the negative 4 times 7.1 times 10 to the ninth. Our rate law is 2,133.98 per second. Yeah, molarity per second, that's our rate. All right, now number six is also pretty easy. The, combu the combustion of hexane um, is given by this equation. Uh, it is found that the rate of C6H14 reacting at 1.2 molarity per second. What is the rate of formation of CO2? Well, this is these are the easiest questions because if you're given a rate of um a rate of I'll say of the reactant, you can find the rate of all the others using the mole fraction or the mole fractions and mole ratios in the equation. So, like let's just solve this out and I'll start explaining later. Let's use blue for this one. Okay, so if we have 1.20 molarity per second, right? And for every two moles of C6H12 or 14, we get 12 CO2. Right, just double check it. Yeah. All right, so let's just multiply that 1.2 divided by 2 times 12. That is just 7.2 molarities per second. And that's pretty much it. And you're just using the ratio. So like if you're given this same beginning um, data, you're looking at if this is what's what the rate of one of the reactions is being consumed, what is the rate of the other reaction being consumed? So that would just be um, for every two, let me use the laser pointer, for every two um, moles of hexane is reacting, you have 19 moles of O2 reacting. And the same thing with water. For every two moles of C6H14 reacts, 14 moles of H2O is produced. And rates are just the same because you're just slapping a um, per second on it. So that goes back to your 1035. And the last question they wanted to go over was, let me, let's just add a little page. Okay, what mass of water must be added to 62.25 grams of KNO3 that makes a solution that is 20% by mass? This is from quiz two. Okay. To 62.25 grams of okay if it's 20 percent by mass k and o3 okay well this is where you make one of those assumptions because okay 20 percent by mass if you have let's say you can assume 100 but let's just make it this way <laughs> Is, you can obviously like go through a really big thing where you assume 100 grams and then you do all that weird stuff. But I just do 62.25 grams. If that's going to be 20%, if that is 20%, let's say that's just 0 0.2. And you have 100% on top, that's your solution. And this is your solute. Do you get the logic? Um, here, right? Because like if, yeah, if this is your mass of your solute and you want your solute to be 20% up by mass, well, you just convert that, or if that's 20%, you just add, you multiply it by five, essentially. So I know it's a really weird, not conventional way of thinking, but it should work. I'm pretty sure, yeah, it does. Pretty sure this was the right answer. Our mass of the solution is 311.25 grams. 
And let's just be sure, all right? So if your solution is 311.25 grams, and we're looking at by mass, not mole fraction, well, let's multiply that by 20%. So times 0 0.2, that's gonna be 62.25 grams. So that's 20%, and that it does match our um, intended solute. All right. That's how um, I saw that's a way you can solve it without assuming 100 um, grams. Hopefully that helps. Let me stop sharing my screen real quick. I have a quick question for that one. Yeah. So for that one, can you just kind of plug it into the mass percent equation and do 20% equals 62.25 over X and just algebraically solve it? You can. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, worked, that's, that sounds okay. like a good workout, yeah. Okay, it worked this time. I just wanted to make sure like mm -hmm. that would work. Yeah, you have to make, yeah, and that works for like that specific problem. I came to that conclusion or that way of thinking because no other information was used. So I'm like, all right, I can assume there's nothing else interfering with it. And that's, that's just like a logic problem. All right, do you have any questions on like the practice test um, or any quiz questions or... If you want to talk about your quiz, I can probably find it to my backpack over there. Um, so I just had a question. Um, I think the last quiz I did pretty good. Um, but if you could kind of go over chapter 16, the Arrhenius equation. The Arrhenius equations? Is this yeah. from this week's worksheet? Um, yeah. That is for this week's worksheet. All right. Um, yeah. I'm that trying to see what exact question. Yeah, that kind of stuff is less um, less conceptual, more um, calculated. Oh. What? Another person coming in. Hey, Cole. I'm about to go over um, chapter 16 uh, and your worksheet this week, if that's okay with you. All right. Um, now, Emma, are you okay with me just sharing my screen for worksheet five and like you see how like my thing is on it, or do you just or like so you can, like get a head start, or do you just want to like ask me specific questions? Because the only way I can probably answer like the generalization stuff is going through the worksheet because I don't have like any <laughs> I don't That's have fine. any like infographic on that kind of stuff because it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, I'm good with that. Just the art class today got canceled so I wasn't really able to kind of go more in depth with it so I'm good with just going over the worksheet all right that's good um I stopped too there we go you guys can see this okay we only see you right now oh, my bad there we go okay let's go here Okay. Now I already worked on this. Um, some notes I want to say. Pay when it's asking these kinds of questions. Pay attention because most most of the time they are going to tell you like this is first order, this is second order, and I don't really remember honestly if there's like a big correlation with your reaction rates. Like if you're the rates we did last quiz where like you found the exponents. I don't know if there's a too big of a correlation with that and then these calculations. I'm kind of rusty on that because I, to my knowledge, I think there's something else that goes into it, but don't quote me on that. Um, okay. So for the first one, reaction A plus B and R is just like supposed to be an arrow. Those are the products, the following rate law, where the rate equals K times A, and since there's no exponent, you just assume one, where K is just a per hour or on a basis of time. So the overall um, order of the reactions first, because I'm pretty sure that's the highest exponent. I think that's the minimal correlation that we're going to talk in the depth about. Um, reactant B is not included in the rate law. That's because it's the zeroth order, because remember, um, those situations in those um, graphs they talk about, right? So the graphs from last quiz, so if you have a reactant, whoops, let's just call that rate. And a reactant, let's say it's just our good old friend I minus, 
right? If there's 0 0.02 molarity, there's 0 0.04 molarity. If that increases by a factor of two, but our rate increased by none, so let's say like this 8.0 times 10 to the negative three. This is again, 8.0 times 10 to the negative three, right? If this is by one, so one equals two to the n. Well, no matter how much we change this um, rate, or not rate, how much we change the reaction, the rate does not change. So two to the what power equals zero, and that's just zero. So that's what your exponent is, zero, zeroth order. So you just don't include it in the rate at all. And your uh, test will be multiple choice. So when it asks you like, which one of these is the rate? If it's zeroth order, it's just not gonna be included. Right? And if that if it's true where that is not included, well, it gives us two um, modes or two modes of the reactants. So if A as this molarity and B as that molarity. And it's asking us, all right, well, if these are our concentrations, what will the rate be? Well, we know that B is not included, so we just plug in A. And that's our basic calculation. And half time, half time is a little weird because I think you play around with it a little more like right before your final. I say half time, then half half life. Um, this, is, but they give you this equation again. It's straightforward. You just plug it in. Cool. By the way, um, we YouTube. I posted some YouTube videos of me going through basically quiz two and three from last year, and I also went at the beginning of this recording. I went through some quiz questions. So I think both of them were form A. So they should be from the Wagner class. Um, ooh, yeah, these ones are fun. Okay, so how long in minutes, I'm talking about this one right here, how long in minutes would it take to react 14.5% of A? So let's go back to, um, no, well, I guess the same thing. So if our rate law is rate equals K times A, and we know it's first order, well, we use our first order equations that they give us right here, okay? I'm sorry to interrupt. Is there actually any way we can like start at E, the step right before that? Yeah, sure. Okay. If A has an initial concentration of oh, 0 0.250 molarity, what is the concentration after 81.6 minutes? Uh, let's see the problem. Okay. Whoops. So E for me, I'm sorry. I The way um my lap or not my laptop, my iPad downloaded is like it split E into two pages, but this is all one uh one question. So we know that it's first order and we solve the half-life right up here, right? And if our half-life, um, if it uses hours, we have to make sure it's consistent. We have to make sure that our um whatever time they give us is converted to whatever half-life unit that is. And we see that as hours. So you can, so you see here, I convert 81.6 minutes and it's hours turns out to be 1.36 hours. And that's what we will use in T. So if the K is the same as the K from before as 0.375, we plug in K, we have T because we um, converted the time they gave us. And this part is what's yummy, okay? So if the initial concentration right here is 2.5 molarity, that is going to be A naught or A to the zero, not A to the T, but A to the zero. So that is just a matter of plugging it in now because your only um your only variable left is the A to the T. So if we plug in the R1.36 hours here and our 0 0.375 from all the way, all the all the way up there, um, and then our given 0 0.250. That product and um, I guess subtracted uh, sum will be negative 1.896. And when we're trying to convert it A, you just E, or yeah, you make these a power V. So E to the this, E to the this. And the E's and then the LNs cancel out. So you just left with A. And then you just have E to whatever that number is. And if you plug it into the calculator, do not forget your negative. And if I were you, I'd just use parentheses because it, it just makes things a lot easier. Our A turns out to be 0 0.150 molarity.
And we're going to reuse that, that same exact thinking when we're solving F. Now, F we're solving for T this time, it doesn't give us um, a time, we're solving for time, but it does give us a final concentration. So basically, instead for this entire equation, it, it gives us A and we solve for T. So basically a flip-flop. So we'll react 14.5% of A. Well, this is just the easy part, not, not at the top of your head, but it's really easy to plug in. Well, if our A naught is 100% and our A of T is whatever is left after the certain T, and we know that whatever is left is going to be 100% minus 14.5%, well, let's just assume that A naught is one and our A to the T is 0 0.855 basically 100% or one minus 0 0.145. So we subtract that from our A to the T. We do LN of our A to the T and we solve for negative 0 0.16. And our LN one, that's just zero, thankfully, because uh, if we do, that's just like exponent stuff, E to the one, yeah, log of one, Ln one is just zero. I don't really know how to describe this. I'm not doing calculus right now. We're doing chemistry. And we know our K is the same 0 0.375 from all the way up there. We plug it in. So zero will cancel out. You're just left with a negative. Well, the negative will cancel out as well. So you just divide 0 0.375 over this 375. And then we get, uh, oh, wait, hold on. How did I get this? Sorry, I, I'm trying to go back to see what I did. Uh, hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I divide this by that, and then I get 0 0.4177. That's hours, and I just convert that back to minutes. That's right. And you can see like in the test, like they'll ask you all of them will be standardized to hours or minutes. You just choose which one. So if it's minutes and you find hours, just convert it to minutes. All right. And again, right here, we see for number two, again, the rate constant is this 6.13 times 10 to the negative two. And we just use that. So if we have it in minutes, so if our K is in minutes, we have to make sure our units match. That's the big thing I want to make sure you guys know. So pay to, if this is given, pay attention. Um, or if you're not given K and you, you are given a T, make sure it's the same units the other way around. Okay. So okay, if we're given a second order reaction, we know that our second order reaction equation is this. And the same thing applies. All right, so how long will it take to decompose 38% of our initial concentration? Well, if it decomposes 38%, we know that A at the time of T is just whatever's left. And this is 38, or that's not supposed to be 38, that's supposed to be 100%. Right? 0.0. .0 two five molarity. I plug that into there and then I just take 62% of that. So I multiplied 0 0.025 times 0 0.62. I ended up with 0 0.0155. And then all we have left is K and T. K is given right here. So we just solve for T right there. That's our only variable left. And we just plug that into calculator. And that turns out to be 400 minutes. Any of you guys have any questions as of right now? No? All right, cool. All right, the activation energy, um, our equation is gonna be given right here. And you see how I like I annotated um, where all the stuff will go. Okay, so first off, if the, if the rate constant doubles, so if, let's just, I'm gonna keep it red. Let's keep it small. The rate double, doubles when the temperature, at, which the experiment is performed is increased by 10 degrees Celsius. Okay, so if K2 equals two of K1, right? And if we divide K1 over 
well, K2 over K1 equals two. And that makes sense. Like if, if K1, if that was a rate of four and it doubled to eight, eight divided by four, that's just two. And right here, we see the same thing. K2 over K1, that's just two. So it's just gonna be LN two on that side, right? And if our R factor is a constant, it is constant, never changes, 8.31 times 10 to the negative three. And I think that's in joules, no, kilojoules. Um, we just plug that in. And right here, you have, to, you have to make sure you have to put in the right one, all right? So if T1 is the initial temperature, and 308 is a new temperature. You well, we added just 10 degrees Celsius to each of these. And Celsius and Kelvin are the same size scale, just different um, numerical values. So the difference is the same. So after we plug that in, one over 298 minus one over 308, and then we basically whatever product we get for this, we divide that over. We t1. Oh, what's minus T2, we divide that over, they'll cross out, and then we multiply R over, and then our activation energy calculates out to this. Are there any specific questions you guys wanna go over? Because we will be going over like all of this tomorrow. I have a question about this one that we're about to do right now. Uh, where do they get the 45 degrees Celsius one? Do they just pick like another random temperature variable to find K? Or does it doesn't matter. Celsius. Oh wait, it says at forty-five degrees. So never mind. Oh, I was looking at like number three, and just I didn't, yeah. I didn't like read it off. Yeah, that that's just a random number they gave you because remember our, the T's that you're given, they're given Kelvin. So whenever you see these Celsius, go ahead and convert them to Kelvin. It won't hurt. Um, yeah, the rate constant is zero point three seven five per hour at T one. What is the half life the reaction at T two? So you're given T1 and T2, you know R, you're given half-life. Look at that equation again. Oh yeah, K2. What were you asking again? I'm sorry, I'm trying to wrap my head around this question again. No, it wasn't even a question. It was just, I didn't, I didn't read it all, but like, I, I know how to solve these ones aren't that bad. You just plug it in basically. Yeah, Th this last one is really not too bad. It's straightforward it's somewhat conceptual somewhat um calculations but the calculations aren't like too wonky like quiz two quiz two was really um funky in how they wanted you to approach things but this one's really straightforward like yeah it, could we do yeah. like four and five just because I don't, I don't know we didn't get to have class this so like like i mean we like we just didn't have class at all today so kind of missed out on like the last half of chapter 16. sure, sure yeah all right well so we have our reaction. I'll just rewrite it out. 2CH3 equals just 1C2H6. So you basically have um, two carbocations forming into ethane. So if that's our reactant, that's going to be A. And C2H6 is going to be our product. That's going to be B. What is the activation energy of the Ford reaction? Well, let's zoom in. So if you're given this entire thing, your activation energy will always be whatever direction you're going. So we're going to the forward reaction. And that's going up here. That entire hump right here is gonna be your activation energy for this forward reaction. And that's just eight kilojoules. At what point A, B, or C would, would um, CH3 appear? Well, we know that it's a reactant so it's at the very beginning. So that T1, that's, you start with, you can't start with your product because you're trying to make the product. What is DH for the Ford reaction? Well, DH, that's gonna be your net, net. So the only thing you do is you take the enthalpy um, at A and you subtract the enthalpy at B. So this entire block, the difference in that, that's going to be your net change in enthalpy, and that's 360 degrees. However, the active for D is acting or is asking the activation energy, the reverse reaction. The reverse reaction goes from the product all the way to the reactant. And if the reverse reaction is going this way, well, 
you can't change the graph up really. You're just starting from a different place. You have to make up all that change in enthalpy plus the normal activation energy of the reaction. So 360 plus eight, that's your entire activation energy. That first hump in order to get to the intermediate. intermediate. What point would C2H6 be found? Again, that's at the very end. Oh, wait. What? Yeah. Wait, so is it exothermic or endothermic? It's exothermic, right? Yeah, it's, it's exothermic. Because if um the net H is negative, yes, yeah, exothermic. So like, for example, like if this was, I don't know, the uh, lattice, <laughs> lattice, lattice, and this was the um, hydration, net would be solution. If it's negative, then it's exothermic. Okay. Right, species C, that's just the intermediate or transition state. Um, fortunately, you don't have, well, I guess fortunately, you don't have a quiz this week, but I would accept either intermediate or transition state because they're kind of one and the same. Um, I guess transition state kind of implies like there it's a solidified intermediate uh, product, but intermediate is usually just like that. I don't know the temporary um phase as it's transitioning like mid picture, but that's more OCHEM stuff that you'll deal with, or PCHEM or inorganic or metallic chemistry, whichever one. All right, number five. Now, this goes into the rules of just rate laws. So if you're given this entire thing, have you guys learned like what's an intermediate? What's a, um, what's a catalyst? Did you guys learn that? It was in like the, the chapter 16 video he told us to watch. Okay, well, let me just go ahead and straight up. It's really easy, okay? So, a catalyst is present at the beginning and is regenerated at the end. So it's a catalyst, like it doesn't, it does do something, but like you, it doesn't, it can be reused again and again. An intermediate is produced, but destroyed at any reaction. So basically, this is a cool way of um, looking at it. So I, I need this for um, tomorrow. So let's just ignore all this so far, right? But if um, if you have something right, yep, let's just say right here. At, if this was the very end, this was at the very beginning. Hypothetically, if this was, at, or if H plus was at the beginning, H plus, and you have H plus again at the very end is a catalyst. So if you have something, and it's going to be, it's always going to be written like this. So if you have something from the top left, always showing up the top bottom right, it's going to be a catalyst. The other way applies to intermediates. If it's produced in any of these products, but is used as a reactant in any of the latter reactants, it's an intermediate. So you're going to see them created and destroyed in this direction. So question 5A, straight up is asking, okay, which what are the intermediates? Okay, so it's asking us, okay, which ones cancel out? So for this first reaction, all right, H3O2 plus, it is created and is destroyed, reacted. Now let's look at these. So H2O, H2O is produced, but there is no uh, H2 as a reactant. So that's not going to be an intermediate. HOI, it is created and it is destroyed right after. I2, it is created and it is destroyed. OH, it is created and then it's destroyed. And again, H2O is created, but it's not destroyed anywhere in these reactants. I3, that's also going to be produced, not really destroyed, but it's the final product, right? And remember, the rate law is usually based off whichever one's a slow reaction, because if all of these are fast, they have to depend on the slow reaction. It's like, you're running a marathon and you're like, there's a guy, a good friend of yours slowing you down. Like you don't want to leave him behind. You have to wait for your own slow friend. And that's all good. That's your rate law. That's what everyone's speed is. We'll go at the same speed as the slowest person there just to make sure. Because ethically in that me um, metaphor, you ethically can't like leave your friend behind. But for chemistry wise, you physically can't. <laughs> can't um, use anything that's not there. All right. 
according to the reaction method, what is the rate law? So the rate law, if we know that our slowest reaction is going to be our rate law, then we just use those reactants like this. Identify the intermediate step. Yeah, so our rate law is just going to be rate equals K and whatever our reactants was for the slow, and we know it's H3O2 plus then I minus. You guys talk about where you get the exponents from? Is it just the, the rate order? Yeah, where, where you get the rate order. So like if you write it out, how do you know what exponents they have? Mm, I'm not sure, I don't know. If it doesn't explicitly tell you, the safe way is just a, whatever is the slow reaction, you just take the coefficients. I just wrote two just in case, but like both these have coefficients of one. So their rate reaction is gonna be one. That's the only time I'm pretty sure you can correlate that kind of stuff because you don't really want to make assumptions like that. But that one, that, that's that's okay. That's okay. Because you're splitting up this entire this entire reaction into a bunch of different reactions, which is what happens in real life. Whichever one's the slowest one. All right, you can physically pinpoint which ones are the rate law, and then you can just use whatever X or go finish since they have as the exponent. Now, rate law, write the rate law for the first seven mechanism and solve for the concentration of the intermediate. All right, well, rate law for the first seven mechanism and solve for the concentration of the intermediate. Well, we just put them next to each other, right? Okay, so. What I'm trying to do here is 3O plus. I know I wrote H plus. Is that O2? Oh. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay, since this is reversible, there's a re rate law that way and a rate law that way. That's reversible. So in this forward reaction, each of these are going to be our reactants. So it's going to be H2O2 to the one, H plus to the one equals L times K equals the rate. In the reverse reaction, we're going to have uh, just H3O2 plus to whatever exponent you have times K. That way, I'm pretty sure it's going to be one. But if the rate law is the same, because you have the same reaction, the forward and the reverse are, should be the same rate. So they just cancel out. And you can just basically replace um, H3O plus in here. You can just replace that with H2O2 and H plus. And then you get this total rate where you just replace the H3O2 plus with what well, basically, it's components. What makes it H3O plus? Yeah, that's it for number five. And right now, our review session is about to end because I have something I'm coming up. But do you guys have any last minute questions before I end things? Um, I have like a really, really basic question. Yeah. I was doing the practice test, and I had the I had the moles of something, and I had the grams of something, but I couldn't find the molar mass. And I know it's like you just divide it or something like that, but I like couldn't. Say that one more time. So I had the moles of something like I had like 4.666 moles and I had like 60 grams and I was trying to find the molar mass of it. Is that possible to do with those two numbers? Yeah. So whatever moles you find should be a byproduct of whatever grams they give you. So like the grams they give you, that does something in the reaction that causes either a delta T or, or it makes a molality that causes that delta T. So you just do whatever grams you have divided by the moles. Two grams divided by moles. So I'll do like 60 divided by 4.6. Yeah, that, should, that should work out. I think. Okay, that makes sense. Get it right. All right. Is that cool. it? Thank you. I'll see you yeah. tomorrow. Yeah, see you tomorrow, guys. Peace. See you. Have a good one. You too.